So as long as it's fair, as long as it's voluntary, inequality is fine. Inequality is great. We want those who succeed to be more rewarded than those who destroy value. But in the sense of our current environment, we have really sinister inequality. If everybody, you know, if, if the water's flowing and everyone is benefiting, right, everyone's cup is filled, um, people are happy, right? They have better things to do than to line up outside of someone's house and threaten to chop their head off. You know, I, I don't think we should be setting up guillotines anywhere. And that's, that's why I love Bitcoin. It's the peaceful revolution, right? Um, but why do people want to set up these guillotines? Because they know the system isn't working. Financial education, financial literacy has to be a focus or a focal point for the future or things are really, we're going to have a lot of situations where folks are either A, getting taken advantage of or B, not necessarily understanding what type of advantages they have. Welcome to the Tucson Blockchain Podcast. Today I have on Jan Pritzker, who's the CTO and co-founder of Swan Bitcoin. Swan Bitcoin launched in March and has taken the world Bitcoin world by storm. It is easily one of the best places to buy Bitcoin and is just killing it when it comes to education and producing content. Uh, I highly suggest to check them out uh, if you want to learn more about what Bitcoin is. But yeah, in this conversation, we talked about a lot of different topics, but kind of the overall theme was talking about a potential Bitcoin economy and the future of Bitcoin. It was a lot of fun and I hope you enjoy it. Cool, and we're recording. So I want to welcome uh, Jan Pritzker to the Tucson Blockchain Podcast. Um, Jan, you're the founder uh, or co-founder and CTO of Swan Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. You've got a pretty uh, formidable resume here. Um, former CTO of uh, Reverb, which is an awesome site that I was just checking out a little bit. And the author of Inventing Bitcoin, which if you get on Audible, it's narrated by Guy Swan, and it's mm -hmm. awesome. I was listening to it earlier. Um, so yeah, thanks. welcome. Thanks for having me on. Uh, very excited to be here. And, uh, you know, always, always fun to chat about Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Jan and I were chatting. We have a lot in common uh, as far as like growing up, but um Grew up in similar side of Chicago and both lived in Ukraine mm -hmm. for a little bit, but, uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I lived there yeah. for the first seven years of my life. I guess I came over here in 89. Yeah. Yeah. And I came over, I was there from like 95 to 2000. So went nice. to Detsky Sod for a little bit. <laughs> nice. That's pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah. Which is preschool. For like kindergarten, those. preschool. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I guess I don't know what happened to Ukraine after I left because it, well, it wasn't really, when I was there, it wasn't Ukraine, it was the Soviet Union. So I never really thought of myself as Ukrainian. Um, I'm more of a, I'm a Soviet Jew as, as you know, that's, that's our culture. Um, and then when I left, it kind of gained its own independence and became more, you know, the Ukraine that we know today. But that's definitely not where I grew up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, even since I've lived there, there's been a tremendous amount of transition. It's always a weird to look back but yeah i mean the fall of the iron curtain was a big shift and kind of threw everything the flux for sure mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um so yeah you came to us in 89 so what what was that like being uh from what you remember i know you moved when you're pretty young but being a ukrainian jew what was that like well you know i was a kid right so kids always have a more rosy uh view of reality right a lot of it's sheltered you don't really know um, what life on the outside looks like, especially growing up in the Soviet Union. Um, people were extremely shut off from the rest of the world. We had state control TV. We had like three channels, right? Like three state channels. Um, no information about America was let in or out. Um, there's censorship everywhere. So it's not like we knew what was in the outside and what, what life could be like. So we lived an absolutely normal life by our own standards. Um, my parents, they like, you know, they stood in bread lines and, and lines for pretty much anything. Uh, I stood in lines with my mom a few times. Um, I, I hardly remember it. I mostly just remember, you know, having a pretty normal childhood, running around with kids in, in my yard and like, you know, throwing knives in the sand as, as Russian kids do. <laughs> Playing with <laughs> knives at five years old, totally normal. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of like, you know, my, my memory. But then when I moved to the States, 
uh, one of the first things that uh, I pretty vividly remember and a lot of immigrants remember is like the abundance you see in just like walking into a grocery store, like walking into your first jewel or uh, Dominic's or whatever you might have. Like Aldi, I think was our first one. We walked into an Aldi and it was just like, there's abundance of everything. And you, you've never seen anything like it if you come from the Soviet Union, because you have like, you know, if you're lucky, if you get one variety of something and, you know, if it's in stock, um, whereas in America, everything is, you know, in multiple there's multiple brands, right? There's, there's lots and lots of abundance. So um, it wasn't really until we moved here that it was obvious that we were missing out on something. And I think my parents knew uh, they were pretty smart. They had some information about what America was like. Uh, my grandpa, actually, he was a civil engineer and he had traveled to America a few times in the 80s um, but for, for work. So he knew a little bit of what it was like. Of course, you know, they kept him sheltered. Uh, you know, I'm sure he didn't get to experience the whole thing. But uh, yeah, it's definitely... Uh, a different world out there where, where the government is, you know, centrally planning the economy and, and there's scarcity of everything. It's just a real problem. Yeah. Was there a pretty uh, tough culture shock to overcome moving to the States? I mean, for me, not as much. Uh, in my initial, like, first year was pretty rough, I guess, as I was learning the language. You know, I was, you know, bullied at school because people were making fun of me and not, not speaking English and stuff like that. But, you know, when you're seven years old, like, within a year, I was like a normal kid. Sure. Uh, and, you know, adapted to American culture and stuff like that. Um, my parents took a while uh, to get back on their feet because they came in, you know, they had a pretty good education in Russia. My dad was a civil engineer and had a lot of computer skills, uh, did some programming there. And my mom was a, a school teacher. Um, but when they got here, they pretty much had to start from scratch because they didn't speak English. Uh, well, we took, we took some underground English lessons back in, uh, in Soviet Union, but they were not enough to get us uh, conversational. So, yeah. uh, so like my dad did a bunch of odd jobs. Like he did photography for like five bucks an hour. Uh, my mom babysat kids for like five bucks an hour. Um, and they did all that. And then eventually they kind of like rose through their respective ranks. So my mom became a director of a, a Jewish Sunday school here. Uh, my dad became a software engineer. Now is like a pretty high up uh, architect solution as architect type of guy at like Salesforce. Um, so, you know, over time they were able to get back on their feet and like get back to kind of where they were in Russia, but definitely took a long time. Um, and the other thing that was kind of interesting for me as I was getting into Bitcoin and, and finding out about, you know, I never really wondered about money before I got into Bitcoin. And um, after I did, uh, a few years ago, I started asking my parents about what happened when we left the Soviet Union and found out that we didn't get to keep our money. Like when we left, they, there was an exchange rate that the government had between US dollars and rubles. Um, which was totally fake. Like nobody wanted rubles. So the, ru the, the, the government's rate, rate was nothing like the real market rate. Um, so they let us exchange $100 per person of, of, US, of rubles to US dollars when we were leaving uh, because they had capital controls at, at their rate. So that's, that's the only money we were able to take out of the country was pretty much 400 bucks. The rest of it was effectively toilet paper because nobody wanted it. Um, so we left the country with like $400 and suitcases full of ju junk that we could sell. So we brought... Uh, like thermometers, uh, glass cutters, watches, like you name it, like there's random things that you could get a lot of in Russia. There are certain things you could get a lot of that were just abundant, right? And, and certain things you couldn't get. Um, so we just brought all the stuff that you get and try to sell it on our way out. Like when we were in Italy, kind of going through immigration, um, you know, I spent a lot of time in like a month in Italy, walking the beaches as a kid and trying to sell thermometers for like uno lira. <laughs> so it was, uh, it was a pretty interesting experience. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. Um, yeah. it, it's, I've always found Russian history be, to be really interesting. And I think part of that is because of my connection to, you know, Eastern Europe and, um, but there's a lot of people that really, uh, in, in my generation that have really missed it and really missed, uh, uh, seeing what communism was really like. Um, and, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's hard to explain, right? Because a lot of people, and I think in America today, there's this whole there's a lot of people on the left, like you know, I, I see some crazy stuff on Twitter, like communism wasn't bad, you know, had all these, you know, and to be fair, there were some things that that like Russia did really well, right? They were great education, uh, amazing space program, right? Like really strong in math and physics, uh, like everybody in Russia got a really good education. Um, you know, women had way more equality in Russia and under the Soviet Union than they do in America, right? So all these kind of like socialist ideals in a lot of ways were happening. But like 
people were <laughs> dirt poor. They were starving. There's you know, red lines. There was like, you know, there was oppression of the free, there was no free press. There was no free speech, um, no access to information. So like, it's kind of a weird, um, it's, it's not all bad, but it's mostly bad, right? It's, it's mostly bad. I would say there's some good things that came out of it, but uh, mostly I think everybody wanted to get the hell out of there. Uh, and that's what happened. And you know, we had this brain drain as soon as the, uh, the curtain was lifted and people were able to leave and like a lot of the smarter people and the people access to, to money and, um, and that understood that they needed to get out, they all got out, right? And uh, a lot of people got stuck behind and faced, you know, hyperinflation and all this other stuff uh, that you get in a transition from, uh, uh, you know, from communism to crony capitalism, which is what they have now. It's not, mm -hmm. not entirely better. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a pretty bizarro world because, you know, you could get an apartment for free, but you'd wait for years to get an apartment. Uh, or I don't know if it was free, but it was, it was very cheap. Um, but you just couldn't, I mean, they weren't available, right? You'd be on a list. Uh, in fact, my parents, at some point, they had to like, they had to divorce on paper so that they could get on two separate waiting lists for getting an apartment, right? Just kind of speed up the process. So people were doing all these hacks in, in Russian society just to like live a normal life. Um, like whenever goods were available for sale, you would buy them even if you didn't need them because you would try to trade them for something else later that you did need when, when that wasn't available. There's just all this weird stuff going on and the black market was huge. It was all US dollars, huge US dollar black market um, because you know you had non-functional currency, you had central planning of prices and nothing made sense and the economy didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, we're seeing similar things in North Korea. The black market is really keep, what's keeping a lot of people alive. Um, and that's kind of what happens when the government comes in heavy handed is it creates black markets because people need things. And it just, like you said earlier, it creates shortages of stuff that people need. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, ca capital controls is something I think is really important to understand um, that your money is really uh, restricted to borders. Uh, we have a lot of um, unique privileges and having the US dollar being valued by the rest of the world or most of the rest of the world at least. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you think there's a, such a complacency in the US when it comes to um, fiscal responsibility and like worrying about inflation and things like that? Well, I do think it's because we get to print the world's reserve currency, right? So it's like, I mean, there's a huge demand for it outside of the US, right? Um, a lot of people talk about the gold standard, um, but if you really look at it, the US dollar is the gold of the world today, right? It's the only currency that is kind of, you know, in the, in the scope of all of fiat currencies, which are all unlimited, really, the US dollar is like the most responsible one, right? So like we are, we are responsible for the world's US dollar supply we can print a whole lot of these things before it becomes a problem for us. We're kind of exporting that to the rest of the world. And it is a bit of a privilege, right? And, and something also that we don't think about as, as U.S. citizens is how free we are with our money, relatively speaking. I don't think we're very free, but compared to the rest of the world, we're incredibly free. Like, I'm not really worried, you know, that I can take my dollars, you know, I can ha have cash in my wallet as I travel internationally. I can send wire transfers internationally. Um, pretty much without issue, but there's a lot of parts of the world where that's not the case, right? There's a lot of parts of the world where you can't carry cash out of the country. You can't wire or do any kind of electronic payments outside of a certain amount. Um, there's a place, I mean, when we traveled to Argentina in 2008 or nine, I think we were down there. Um, we found out that you like people who wanted to leave Argentina on travel, they had to get a permission from the government for a certain amount that they could of cash they could take with them to spend on their travel. Right. So they couldn't just like arbitrarily take all their money. They would have to say, oh, we request, you know, 500, whatever, $500 worth of Argentine pesos to take with us. So it's this kind of thing where capital controls exist all over the world. And here in the U.S., a lot of people don't even realize that this is how other people live because we don't really think about it. Um, we do also have this kind of stuff, right? We have reporting rules and, you know, all this kind of stuff. I don't know if you can carry, think if there's a $10,000 limit to the cash you're supposed to carry through an airport. I don't know what happens if you carry more, maybe, you know, you get stopped. Um, most people don't face this, right? Most people don't need to carry $10,000. So they're like, okay, it's fine. It's not going to affect me. Um, but if you're in Argentina and they tell you, you can take $300 with you on vacation, it's like a totally different story, right? Or if you're in the Soviet union and you literally, you can't leave the country, you have to leave all of your wealth behind or you get a hundred bucks. That's like, that's the, all you can take with you. Um, once you experience that, you have a totally different perspective on, 
um, this kind of luxury that we live in in the United States. And, and that's why there's complacency because we are in a unique situation. We control the world's money supply. We can do whatever the hell we want. And we live in a relatively liberal democracy where we can you know, be mostly free. So yeah, we're complacent um, until, until that liberal democracy falls apart. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's why being outside of the country and seeing these things is, uh, gives people such a unique perspective. Um, mm -hmm. I find it very, my experience to be very valuable and, uh, I, yeah, it, so what convinced you initially to jump into Bitcoin? I know you had a little bit of a journey with, that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, there's all these people who are like, I read the white paper and I totally got it in the first try. And I just, <laughs> I just don't believe it. I just don't believe it. I'm sorry. I'm like, I yeah. think I'm relatively smart compared to most people. <laughs> you know, not, not to like speak too highly of myself, but you know, let's, you know, I've been working in technology for 20 years, right? I, I think I'm like, you know, uh, I know my stuff, right? And the first time that I saw Bitcoin, which was in 2011, I understood it as a payment system. I, I read like uh, open source payment system, blah, 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 blah. And I said, okay, this is cool. This is interesting. Um, I, I'll buy some, whatever. And it was like 30 bucks. And it went down to like $2. And I sold all of it, of course, at like a total noob at the bottom. Um, because I didn't understand markets. I didn't understand finance. I had no idea about how any of that works. Uh, nor did I even think about Bitcoin as money, right? I thought of it as, as so, some kind of payment system where I could get like, you know, a share of this payment system. If it works, great. Maybe this number will go up. I don't know. So that was 2011. And basically I didn't read the white paper. I didn't do anything. I didn't do any research. I just read a slash that article and was convinced enough to buy it, but not enough to understand what it was. And, you know, to be fair, I was working on startups and, and I had my head in other places. Um, and even in 2013, then, you know, I basically forgot about it after I sold the bottom. And then in 2013, um, heard about it again, it was at a thousand bucks and, you know, I saw Coinbase and again, as a technology guy, I came out and looked at Coinbase and looked really nice. Like somebody had thought through this problem. It was well-designed. So I said, okay, if somebody's thinking about this, you know, to this extent, it must be serious. Like maybe we should buy some again. I bought a little bit there, you know, and again, and then it goes down to like $300. So of course, you know, I'm like, I, I don't know what I keep getting into and, and didn't, I didn't research it. And so it wasn't really until 2016 um, that I finally started paying attention to it wholeheartedly. And it was honestly like, I think what sold me was this Andreas video called Currency Wars, somewhere between Currency Wars and this other video about like uh, the immutable monolith that he has, where he talks about like Bitcoin's immutability and Bitcoin as, as money. Um, but most importantly, the Currency Wars video where he really talks about like what happened in Greece and Cyprus and what happened, uh, you know, in Zimbabwe and, and Venezuela and all these places that where the money was broken, right? And he talks about these things. And I made, he made me very aware that money was broken all over the world, something I had not thought about at all. And once I understood that it was broken, I then uh, was able to tie it back to the Soviet Union experience, you know, with my family and, and like kind of talking to my parents about that. And, and then understanding that this actually happened to me. I lived under a broken money system and I never knew it. And, you know, this is the case for most people in the world. They live with a broken money, but they don't know it because they don't know any better. They don't know what life outside of their society looks like. And they're told this is the money you have to use, like by force, by their government. This is what you have. Good luck. It's inflating by 50 to 50,000% a year and enjoy. Um, <laughs> so like, that's not a good society to live in. So once I started to kind of understand Bitcoin as money, my, I had a total switch of of um, a focus. And I said, this is like, this is the most important thing in the world because money is freedom, right? Money, money is that which gives you freedom. Um, if you don't have money and in a lot of cases, you don't have speech. I would even argue in America, right? Like we say free speech, but how much political speech could you even have if you don't have money? Um, if the country goes to shit, um, what are you going to need to get out? You're going to need money to bribe people, right? In any dysfunctional society, you need money for bribes. In a functional society, you need money for the official bribes, which are, you know, the lobby, right? But in any case, you need, you need money. Um, and if your money is broken and, and your prices aren't communicating anything because you're living in a socialist regime and your money is being printed to infinity, so the, the money itself can't be used as a measuring stick for anything, uh, this is the fundamental problem of society, right? And as I researched it more and more, like I read Safe's book, the Bitcoin Standard, great book, um, and I read all these other uh, resources around sound money, Austrian economics, and all this kind of stuff. And it started to make a lot of sense to me that 
if we fixed money, we fixed so many problems in society. And so as a technology person, I was like, what should I be working on? That's more important than this. This is, there's nothing more important than this. Um, it took me like two years to really develop enough conviction uh, to do that because I was working on reverb and that was my baby. And, you know, in 2016, when I first got into Bitcoin, uh, I was in like year four of reverb. It was growing like a hockey stick. So I was, I couldn't focus on Bitcoin, but I was doing two to three hours of Bitcoin research every day. Um, and at a point, you know, in 2018, I, when, when the moon happened <laughs> uh, and the price was, was very, very high, it felt like, you know, Bitcoin had arrived in some sense on the global consciousness. People were starting to recognize it as, as a real thing. And I said, like, there's nothing more important that I could be working on. So I had to leave and, and do that. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. It is kind of a journey and it's a whole paradigm shift. None of us almost nobody understands what money is and uh that's the bitcoin you know for me as well was my first introduction into learning the way that money worked on kind mm -hmm. of a larger scale and one of the things that Safedine talked about in his book was time preference and how time mm -hmm. preference has major impacts on society and i think that was the turning point for me because I was working in social work, you know, with people with drug addictions and mental health issues. And, uh, and I thought that was going to be my life's work, but I was looking at it as like, this is just nine one one, like cleanup, like all the issues are tied to the way that money works. If people had a different perspective on time preference, we wouldn't have a lot of these same issues, you know, of poverty of all these other things. And, 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 and the more I learned, learning that inflation is one of the greatest causes of wealth inequality in a society, mm -hmm. um, not uh, greedy capitalists, like a lot of people will say. Yeah. Um, but that's I mean, a, it's a big one. It's like, that's why I keep trying to, like, I'm, I'm in a very, I think my pretty much all of my friends are liberal. Um, mm -hmm. And it's very like, you know, everybody's like, you know, we need to fix wealth inequality. We need to redistribute the wealth. And it's like, if you start looking at the is actual issue, you realize that that's just the tip of the iceberg. The whole iceberg is the money. The money is causing the problem and you can keep redistributing wealth to kingdom come. All you're going to do is upset a whole bunch of people and break down your society. Um, but if you fix the money, you kind of fix that underlying problem and you don't have that issue anymore. Um, now, nobody's saying it's going to happen overnight or that it's an easy thing to do. It's definitely not an easy thing to do because our entire society, like just everywhere is based on this one like, extremely bad idea that we should have inflationary money. Um, and, you know, people like just drink it, the Kool-Aid and they're taught this from their the time they're born. And it's, it's funny, like my, I don't know if this is, this is a bit of an anecdote, but my kid, my, I have a daughter is just starting first grade and we got their like first grade syllabus. And one of the things they're going to cover is money. And the title was like money, earning and spending money. And I was like, earning and spending, well, what happened to saving? <laughs> like, where, where's that part of the whole money equation, right? Like to me. Uh, learning to save is like one of those things that, you know, as, as I was a kid, I was taught, you know, here's your allowance or here, if you do some work, you know, you have some money, you can save that money, you can buy something, right? Like saving is a huge part of how you should think about money. Um, but we've been sort of as a society taught that this is not a thing. You should not save your money. You should either spend it immediately or you should invest it um, on something very risky like the stock market, which, you know, most people have no business in because they have no idea what the stocks are. So all they do is they buy the index and that has its own set of problems because now you have this massive passive investing bubble. Uh, so like now we've, we've broken everything. We've broken stocks because nobody's actually actively managing them. We've broken, you know, people's idea about saving because uh, the money is just evaporating in front of their eyes. And then we lie to them on top of that and tell them, oh, it's no big deal. It's only evaporating at 2% a year, um, which is certainly not the case. If you look at anything that's of, of value uh, that people do actually desire, you know, housing, healthcare, stocks, um, nothing actually inflates at 2% a year. It's a total joke. So, um, you know, I think we have a fundamental issue here. Money is broken, but to change our perception of what money should look like requires a total rethink of like society at large. And nobody's willing to do the work because all of the entrenched uh, pieces of this society, they're all self-serving, right? And I'm not talking about maliciously, like people in government, you don't need to ascribe malice to them. Like they're doing a job, right? Their job is, you know, save the poor people. Okay, let's save poor people. Let's give them a stimulus check. That's my job. My job is to, you know, to give people stimulus checks. Otherwise, I get voted out of, out of office. And this is a perpetual motion machine. Like, you can't break out of it. Uh, and those stimulus checks just lead to more and more inflation. So it's like, 
who are you trying to save? What are we trying to help here? Um, at the same time, they can't sit on their hands either because then they're just going to, you know, they're going to lose their elections. And the next guy's going to come in and that guy's going to print the stimulus check. It doesn't matter. It's like he's going to be the guy A or guy B. Somebody's going to print the stimulus check. Can't get away from it. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a complex problem. And, and so I think this is why we work on Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've definitely uh, thrown all hope out in uh, the political <laughs> process uh, and dedicated my life to to solely bitcoin because you know yeah. like our, our two you know there's third party out there but our two options right now are two people that are going to print lots and lots of money and uh um and our yeah and i, I don't think it, it matters if there's a third option or a fourth option because at the end mm -hmm. of the day it's like who's gonna vote for somebody who will literally tell them like no, we're not going to give you money. Like I would always vote for more money. This is why people vote for tax breaks, right? Mm -hmm. Voting for tax breaks is more money. Voting for stimulus checks is more money. It, it doesn't matter which side you give it to. It's still more money. Um, so it's all the same game. And um, I agree with you. This is why like, I'm very detached from the political process. And like <laughs> my wife is very into it. And you know, we always have this like tension. My, my whole community of people is like super fired up about the election. And I'm like, what is this? What does this change really? Change. I mean, it changes something to some degree. I think there's some social issues, which are uh, potentially important. Um, but outside of that, like you're not fixing the problem. You're just replacing one dude with another dude, and then four years later, you got another dude, and they're all going to do the same thing. So it's you got to fix the underlying cause. Otherwise, you're like you said, it's nine one one. You're treating the immediate symptom, and and you're you have such a small time window to do it in. Um, you're not really going to make a meaningful change in society with with that time window. Yeah, absolutely. So Bitcoin is really, uh, I saw a funny tweet um, today and it said like, uh, this guy said that uh, Bitcoin is the only community where the price can go up and people are complaining. Um, <laughs> and I'm definitely one of those people that's uh, feeling a little bit hesitant right now um, <laughs> due to potential restrictions coming out. So Marty Bent's been Mm -hmm. um, putting out a lot of stuff about uh, potential travel restrictions that would essentially make it illegal to self-custody. Um, so what, what do you think are some challenges standing in the way of uh, Bitcoin really pushing fiat currencies out of the way? Well, I think uh, I don't want to take credit for this because I think this is more a Corey's idea. Corey's my co-founder, founder of, of Swan and Give Bitcoin. Um, but he talks a lot about like the race and the battle, um, the race being like, you know, we need to basically get people, uh, get Bitcoin into the minds of people before it becomes a war, right? Like if enough people have Bitcoin, then they're just going to act on, uh, in their own self-interest as Bitcoiners, right? Um, so like if every member of Congress has Bitcoin, if, you know, if the president has Bitcoin, their views on Bitcoin are going to change, right? Um, the, there is definitely multiple opposing forces, even now in our government, right? Like you heard the Libra hearings, we had people on one side, you know, people like Brad Sherman, who today just came out with some brilliant gems around how we should ban cryptocurrencies. I mean, people like that who are like just basically quivering in their boots and they're like, this is serious. Cryptocurrencies are coming to kill us. Um, you know, Bitcoin is dangerous. It's used for, it's by crim it's for criminals and blah, blah, blah. And they're like on that side, they want to ban it, right? And then there's people on the other side who are like, well, this is, you know, we, is, first of all, we probably can't stop it. Uh, even like, you know, chairman of the banking commission, you know, Crapo, he said, we, we probably couldn't stop it if we, even if we wanted to, because it's a global thing, right? Even if we, as the United States decide to shut it down in some way, like, let's say we try to regulate exchanges or make self-custody illegal in some way. Well, it's not going to happen all over the world. And wherever it doesn't happen, then that's going to be a leaky bucket. You're always going to have that leak. And to me, it's like, it goes back to what has government ever been good at stopping, right? Even like extremely authoritarian governments like Soviet Union or Venezuela or even North Korea. I mean, there's leakage, right, out of these countries. Um, and when it comes down to like, look at the drug trade, right? We, we've been totally unable to stop the drug trade. Um, and this is a physical things. Like you literally just put guys on the border and stop the drug trade. With Bitcoin, you have to stop information from flowing over the internet text information, potentially emojis, potentially graphics, right? You can encode a Bitcoin transaction, literally anything. So, uh, you know, and the miners and the people who run nodes, like they could be absolutely anywhere. They don't have to be identified. So 
um, you can try to make it really, really onerous, right? You could say, okay, everybody has to register. We have to know about all the miners in our country or you go to jail. We have to know about uh, all the cryptocurrency exchanges or, you know, we shut you down or we the license you, whatever. You can put all this regulation on it, but it's a leaky, leaky bucket, right? There's peer-to-peer -peer exchanges. You can send the information freely. And all you're doing is you're proving that the bucket is leaky because it will continue to function, right? And when you prove that you, are, you have an inability to stop something, then you're just reinforcing that thing's uh, value proposition. I mean, Bitcoin's very value proposition is that it is outside of the control of governments. So when governments try to stop it and fail, they're just going to reinforce the value proposition and the number is going to go up. And the problem that the governments are going to face is that pretty soon, uh, more people with more money are going to be the people who, who are the Bitcoiners, right? I mean, look at the development of the American mining, mining industry. You've already got public companies mining Bitcoin. Uh, I'm an advisor of one called Riot. Um, you have Peter Thiel, right, investing millions of dollars into, uh, you know, mining facilities in Texas. So you already have a development of a very significant mining industry. You already have tons and tons of capital in these larger you know, crypto exchanges like Coinbase and Crack. And now I don't love Coinbase, but let's, you know, they're part of this ecosystem in the sense that they are going to, they, they carry weight, right? They're a multi-billion dollar company. Kraken just got their uh, banking charter from Wyoming, right? Mm -hmm. They're a multi-billion dollar company. So now you're talking about, it's not just a bunch of dudes. It's like multi-billion dollar companies with a lot of weight to throw around. And you have already some people in Congress that are convinced that this is a good idea. We should let innovation happen. Um, or we're going to lose out to other countries. And it's just going to be that race between the people who get it. I mean, look, at this point, if you're speaking out against Bitcoin, you're also speaking out against Jack Dorsey, you know, CEO of Twitter, right? Like the, the world's communication platform, effectively, the president's on it, right? Now, you want to talk about Bitcoin being evil? Um, it's owned by public companies. So like, what, where does that put you once you start to, to be, uh, you know, against American business, you're not, you're not going to be in favor with those businesses anymore. And um, if we look at it realistically, America is run by corporations. So the more corporations that have Bitcoin, the more they're going to be able to influence uh, the lawmaking bodies to make it okay. Um, that's, that's how I see it. I, I really think we're winning that race. I don't think it's going to come down to a battle. Um, now that said, if they do go down the road of trying to like make custody illegal or whatever, I, I, I Honestly, first of all, I can't imagine how that works under the First Amendment, but let's suppose they, they get that through. Uh, well, yeah, then Bitcoin will be a black market currency. Um, but look at what happened anywhere where there was a black market currency. Look at the Soviet Union as a perfect example. Um, there's a great article. I put it out on the tweet a few weeks ago, and I can retweet it. It's uh, by a company called Winton. Um, and they went and did research on black market currencies all over the world. And what happens to the black market is it eventually overpowers the white market because the government cannot keep its the lid on the thing. Uh, I mean, look at what the Soviet Union did, right? You, you had extreme capital controls. The US dollar was illegal. You'd go to jail if you were using dollars, but like 80% of the economy ran on dollars. Like every, anything of value that you wanted in the Soviet Union, you had to pay for with dollars. So, um, because the, because everybody knew the ruble was garbage. So you can spin your stories and your lies and pretend like everything's okay, but people know that the thing doesn't work. So they use something else. And that's going to be the case with Bitcoin. And anywhere where the currency is broken enough, Bitcoin will be used. Um, and we're seeing that today, and it's going to continue to be used regardless of regulations or not. I think it's, it's a complete joke to try to regulate it, but they're going to learn the hard way. Yeah, well, that's pretty reassuring hearing that. And yeah, it's 2020 has been a crazy year. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's been, there's just been so much that's, that's happened. Um, from Twitter, or sorry, not Twitter, Cash App and uh, MicroStrategy buying Bitcoin to uh, the, you know, the banks getting in big trouble for doing stupid stuff again. And, um, I can't remember. And then the OCC, the, like the OCC came out and said that it was okay for banks to custody crypto. Now you could think of that, it could be, one thing is it could be good for Bitcoin, it could potentially legitimize Bitcoin. The other thing, it could be potentially like laying the groundwork for us to try to do you know, another executive order 6102 and basically get everybody's Bitcoin custody of these banks. And then one day just flip a switch and say like, oops, Bitcoin's illegal. We've exchanged it for US dollars, please enjoy. <laughs> um, yep. That could happen. So self custody is extremely important um, for that reason. I'm not, I don't want to downplay that, but um, I don't know. I, I guess I'm more optimistic that, that, uh, that people will see Bitcoin for what it is because it's being adopted so quickly by, by so many legitimate people at this point. 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, markets always win. I think that's kind of that's, the message. That's right. Yeah. And, and that's what I try and tell people too, you know, about Bitcoin is it just is better money. I mean, there's so many aspects of it and the real competition that comes uh, for Bitcoin would be for governments to actually practice good monetary policy um, and to make a currency that was like, was better and they're never going to do that um yeah it's against think, their self-interest and that's that's the thing is like people a lot of times they still don't get it and like why why wouldn't the government just make their own digital dollar and compete with bitcoin well it doesn't compete with bitcoin that's not why people are buying bitcoin <laughs> they're buying it because it's not under control of the, uh, of the government that's the whole point um so a lot of people don't get that still and it's going to take a little while to get that through yeah i think part of the reason why there was such a um freak out in Congress over uh, the Libra, Facebook Libra, it was that they knew that they were going to be irre irrelevant in a second, that it's not that hard to create a better money than what they have. Um, yeah, one of the biggest uh, things about Bitcoin is that it's self-settling, um, that you can send it peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. Do you, so kind of the, kind of the general uh, uh, theme in Bitcoin is that it is like a digital gold and store of value. So the original white paper uh, was written describing it as a peer to peer cash. Do you think the narrative has changed or is it just in a time of transition and it eventually will become that peer to peer cash? Well, I think there's two things. One is the word cash is a very specific word that, I mean, he could have said it was a peer to peer payment system, but he said cash. Uh, mm -hmm. I think cash is something interesting because it's, it's a bare instrument, right? You carry cash with you. And if you give cash to somebody else, they now have the cash. They don't need to clear it with anybody. So I think actually the word cash is not really about it being used for payments as much as it is about it being a bare asset where you, it is the final settlement thing. There's nothing else to exchange it for. It's not an IOU. So sure. I, I kind of think of it that way. And if you look at the writings of Satoshi, he made tons of references to gold, scarcity, um, you know, things like that, like number go up, <laughs> will attract more people. I mean, he said stuff like that. He kind of s saw it as I think, uh, uh, so I, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth because I don't know what he was thinking, but, um, a lot of people, and I think this comes from BJ Boyapati and a lot of other folks is that you have to have something be valuable first before you use it as a medium of exchange, right? Like the idea that money just spontaneously arises and all of a sudden everybody starts using it. And this is how people criticize Bitcoin all the time. It's like, it's not money. I can't pay for anything with it. Well, first of all, that's not true. You can definitely pay for things with it if you wanted to. Um, but most importantly, you can pay for fiat currencies with it, like 24-7, 365. You can buy any fiat currency in the world practically with Bitcoin. So um, I would argue that this is already a very important part of it becoming a money because it's freely exchangeable for all other monies um, in a way that actually like you may not find a pair that you want, like, you know, Libyan currency to, I don't know, Russian rubles or something like that. But through Bitcoin, you pretty much can match any of those currencies. So I think there is something interesting there. Um, I think that Bitcoin becomes a money over time. Uh, it's already a money for some people in, in some cases. Um, and it's always relative to what other options do they have. So if they're in America uh, and they're buying coffee at Starbucks, they're obviously not going to use Bitcoin. It, it wouldn't, first of all, make any sense because it's, it's going up a lot in values and there's also tax consequences to doing that. Um, on the other hand, if you are in Venezuela or Nigeria or places like that where your local currency is hyperinflating, then yes, you may want to use it for transactions because that's the only thing that you have that does work. Um, either you have that or you have US dollars, right? And depending on your access to US dollars, you may want to use the Bitcoin. So um, I think it's all very relative to your situation. I think it's already money for some people, some places. I think over time, as it becomes more widely distributed and everybody has some, then you can actually use it as money. Uh, it doesn't really make sense for me to spend it today knowing that it'll go up a lot in value as more people adopt it. But at a certain point, there's you know, an equilibrium that's reached because most people have some. And at that point, the price and the depth of market is so big that it's not gonna have as much volatility. Um, and it's not going to be as like, I'm not going to hoard it as much. Uh, I'm still going to probably hoard it more than I would a US dollar because that's, mm -hmm. you know, being inflated all the time. Uh, I might save it for purchases that I only really, 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 you know, want. I, I might save it for a house or a business 
or something you know worthwhile and i might not buy you know trinkets uh, cheap plastic trinkets but like safe says right when you have sound money you don't spend that on cheap plastic trinkets you invest in things that are worthwhile and i think bitcoin does that um but i think it's an evolutionary process you can't expect that to happen overnight and anybody who's um, saying Bitcoin failed because it's not global money within 10 years, like it, that's a complete joke, right? How long did gold take to become global money? Uh, I mean, <laughs> we don't really know, but it was, it was certainly not 10 years. Uh, sure. It was centuries. So we have to think of it like that. Yeah, that's a good explanation. Yeah, I got in a, uh, got pulled into a Twitter. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know what to call it. I wouldn't call it a fight, but it was just a storm between um a couple gold bugs and uh a couple bitcoin bugs and uh some guy said gold is money bitcoin's not and i said i could spend my my bitcoin a lot more places than i can spend my gold that's for sure 100 yeah. percent for sure yeah I, I don't get that whole argument at all from gold bugs they should see honestly they should see bitcoin as gold it's the same thing um but Bitcoin also has these magical properties, like it could be instantly transported across the world, whereas gold doesn't have that property. And so all of a sudden, you've been, it, it's hard to bucket it, right? It's not really digital gold. Digital gold is like really just a fundamental uh, baseline from where we start, but it's so much more than that. And, and just by constraining yourself to that one thing, you, you don't see the whole picture. I mean, it does so much more. Um, it can be used as a medium of exchange. It can be used as a uh, cross-border settlement thing when two countries don't trust each other like what else are they going to settle the, their debts in us dollars um, when the us can just print you know press a button and cut them out of the uh, financial system like they, they're doing in venezuela and, and iran and stuff i mean this is not a functional system when um you know i've talked about this on other podcasts but the us is like this one central point of failure right the whole world financial system is built on us playing uh nice like not printing too many dollars just enough uh, not sanctioning too many countries, just the right ones at the right time. Um, you know, like we are in control of the whole thing. And despite what you might think, like, is the U S good, quote unquote, good or quote unquote, bad, um, whatever values of good and bad are, are in your head, it doesn't matter because it's a, like, I'm a software engineer. I would never build a system with a one central point of failure like that. It's just a bad system design. Right. And that's what we have with the world monetary system as we've given the U S all this power to press all these buttons. And uh, the end result is they press a button over here and like people all the way on the other side of the world are suffering. Um, to me, that's not a, a fair uh, system at all. It, it sucks. Um, it may be nice for people in America in some way, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't like feel good about living in a system like that where, where we get to abuse the rest of the world with our printing press. Uh, so I'd rather you know, have a system where nobody can mess with the money yeah. and that, that's portable. Yeah. That's definitely the approach I'm trying to take with people is, is making this a much more uh, personal conversation um, and trying to relate it to people's lives because I think the general person, you know, just cares about people and cares about their community. Um, but they have trouble connecting the dots between the way that money works and how it impacts us and impacts the world around us. Uh, it's and hard with Americans. It really is because they don't experience financial oppression on a day-to-day -day basis. It's, it's mm -hmm. just, you can explain to them that wealth and quality is caused, caused by money printing, but nobody's going to believe you or, or think it through that way. I, I think least of all the people who are affected by it the most, right? Like the people at the very bottom who are living paycheck to paycheck, just they don't have time to stop and think about money. They're trying to feed their family. Um, mm -hmm. And you're not going to convince them to buy Bitcoin. Um, this is a problem. I think it's a big problem. Uh, it, it, it sucks because, you know, I'm like in Bitcoin education. I wrote this book and wanted to reach more people. And I've been trying to send it out for free to people. But I'm also a realist in that, like, what happens with anything of this nature is that the people with the most education and the most money get it first, which does skew the, the distribution a bit. It, it is a bit like, you know, people like in Venezuela are getting some Bitcoin now where they probably wouldn't have any other wealth in any other capacity. So that's good. Um, but I do think there's a problem there where, uh, it's going to be a little bit of a trickle down. People who, who understand it first are going to, you know, they're going to be advantaged. And over time, it's going to get distributed through, through society um, by people just like anything else. And there's always been an unequal distribution of resources in society. Uh, and that's just what it is. Yeah. I had Guy Swan on the podcast. And one of the things that he talked about was uh, how inequality isn't necessarily a bad thing uh, because people that produce value should be uh, more rewarded. Um, for the value that they produce instead of penalized or, um, or for there to be like a, 
unfair distribute or um, incentive structure where, you know, so like one of the things that I'm seeing yeah. today is like um, the, the word corporate socialism is thrown around a lot, mm-hmm. um, which I think is rightfully so. So a lot of these big corporations have unfair advantages uh, compared to smaller firms. And I think we're seeing the impacts of that across our economy is small business owners all over the place are having to shut their doors. Um, I think Bitcoin really like an economy that would run on sound money would be a lot fairer in that regards because one people would be prudent with their money and be saving instead of overextended um and then two there it would be a lot harder to um benefit from being closer to the regulator because they're not in control of the money printer um Mm, that's exactly right yeah because they could just, I mean, every time a major corporation fails, they just backstop by money printing, right? So they're like, yeah. oh, airlines are failing. Cool. Uh, <laughs> let's print a whole bunch of money and bail them out. Um, whereas if you're like a startup airline, you're not going to get any of that money. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and I think the other thing is that all these bigger corporations, they end up, you know, they end up writing the laws. So you end up all this, all this regulation, which is extremely onerous, that prevents the entry of new players. And then these old entrenched players just spend you know, millions of dollars on lobbying government to make it you know, more and more exclusionary so that you have all this wealth concentrated to like, the, you know, the FAMGA companies. And uh, that's what it is, right? Because they've eaten all of the other companies alive and uh, nobody can compete anymore. Um, so, yeah, I agree. I think, I think that it's true that there's always going to be inequality. And I think that's a good thing that, I mean, yes, people should be recognized for, for better contributions to society. There's also inequality of like luck of the draw. I mean, you could be born on a bare, barren piece of land. You could be born on a wheat field. You'd be born on an oil field, right? It depends on where you are geographically and what resources are at your disposal. A lot of that is luck of the draw. Um, but we shouldn't make it further unfair by like having the money supply also be manipulatable, right? Like mm-hmm. if we fix that part, then we should have, uh, you know, like a true free market society where, where prices are actually meaningful and they communicate information and the economy works smoothly. And the, you know, really there's the Forex market. There's tr- how much, I don't know, trillions of dollars a day of volume of Forex um, goes away, right? This is what something safe talks about, like this insane inefficiency between exchanging currencies. Um, if you just have Bitcoin, right? You, you don't need that. So many other things get fixed by this um, that yes, there will continue to be inequality always, but at least it will be inequality that is based on either skill or luck of the draw and not also by manipulation by the government, which is like the worst thing. It's like exacerbates all these other problems. And it just leads yeah. to, you know, what, where we are now, where it's like such disparity that now you have revolution like uh, on your uh, doorstep. Right. And, um, you know, n- nobody wants to live in a society like that. I think even if you're rich, you don't want to live in a society where all the poor people are, you know, lighting torches and coming to your door. <laughs> it's not a good place to live. Yeah. I think, uh, I think this conversation is probably more important than ever because a failure of a currency really creates a failure in a society and just like completely destabilizes it, which isn't really good for anybody. Um, yeah, there's an excellent one podcast, th- by the way. Sorry, I wanted to mention a shout okay. out to Stefan Lavera because I just listened to this one uh, episode with uh, the authors. I'm sorry, I forgot their names, but the authors of a book about they studied hyperinflation in, in Zimbabwe and stuff. And they like just it's scary when they talk about what happened in Zimbabwe and they're like talking about, you know, uh, that and you're listening to it and you're just literally like t- ticking off all the boxes about what's happening here now. I'm not saying we're going into hyperinflation, but a lot of what they're talking about is, you know, when money is broken and society becomes uh, broken in this way, then you have like this increase in uh, like very, d- um, the, the political machine breaks down. You have like a lot of fighting instead of, you know, working together. And like, it's, it's what we're seeing now. We're having extreme polarization, like near civil war, this kind of thing. And it's all really because the money got us here, like the, the broken money got us here and nobody sees this. This, this is insane. Nobody sees this. It's just very painful. Yeah. I mean, I really, you know, one of the questions that I asked myself a lot as a kid um, was how did Nazi Germany get to where it was? And I think the answer is, you know, the apathy that we see in our society today. Um, around these things, you know, the polarization that you see between, um, 
you know, these groups on the right and these groups on the left and literally getting in the streets and fighting was kind of like the communists and the fascists mm -hmm. um, in the streets of Berlin. Uh, I don't know if we'll get there, but the, we definitely have a potential to get there. And I think that's a really, really important um, idea to, to discuss and kind of beat down upon because you know we're not invulnerable we're humans mm -hmm. if humans have done it before then we're susceptible to do it again a hundred percent and i think we have such a a blind spot as americans because we think we're just immune to this stuff because like you know we were the good guys we fought the nazis mm -hmm. like we'd not th this would never happen here um you know zimbabwe was a joke we're a serious country we would never have hyperinflation but this is actually one of the things that they point out in this podcast that zimbabwe wasn't the joke actually they had a very sophisticated financial system was modeled on the uk and South Africa, and it was not a joke. Um, and initially, when Mugabe came to power, it was not like he pressed the printing button and just like made everything worse. Um, it was all just like slow erosion of things through social programs that were expanded and, you know, this and that. And like over time, it led to where it led to, but it wasn't like it happened overnight. Um, and it's the same thing here. It's like if you look at what's happening, we're printing an insane amount of money, polarization in politics, people in the streets. It doesn't look that bad yet, um, but you know, when does it become bad? Um, the one thing that gives me hope is that America, I think, has a very strong decentralization in its government, right? This like three, idea of three-branch democracy, which yeah. I think almost, I don't know of any other country that has it as strong as us, right? With our First Amendment and Second Amendment and all these like uh, pillars of our, of our society, they're so ingrained in our culture. So the question is, do those pillars survive? Um, you know, an, an attack on, on that, on that, right? Like an authoritarian um, leaning to the society, which I think we very clearly are, are going to a very authoritarian type of society uh, with financial repression, uh, with the digitization of the dollar, especially, right? This gives the government very good tools. And this is why you're talking about things like the travel rule and all this other stuff, you know, in the name of fighting drugs and terrorism and child pornography, they'll sell you all the, the, the scariest things in the world um, to get these things through. Uh, the Patriot Act, right? Like all of these things got through at a time where we were scared. And right now we're scared. We have coronavirus, we have terrorism, we have pornography, whatever. We're scared of all these things. And it's the perfect time to inject us with all kinds of junk, right? Like, like more restrictive rules uh, on what we can do with our money. And um, once that sets in, it starts to like erode at the, at the actual freedoms that we have in society. So I guess my question is like, does, do these three pillars... Uh, are we decentralized enough to resist that? Like, is the judicial system going to, for example, hold up uh, a ban on Bitcoin or will it be struck down because it's a First Amendment violation? Like, how will that play out? Um, if I see that, you know, for example, they say, I think they're going to come at it through, through regulating of exchanges. But if they were to say Bitcoin is illegal, like that would be a clear First Amendment violation. And if I see the judicial system hold that up, I would be like, okay, this may be time to start exploring, uh, you know, an exit out of this country mm -hmm. because this is this is basically the fall of democracy and the fall of, uh, well, of liberal, you know, values here of of like, you know, free speech and, and all that. Um, I think there's been an erosion in that for sure. Um, so to me, I would my optimistic scenario is that Bitcoin is our fourth pillar. It actually comes in and it fixes this. It doesn't it doesn't make things worse. It actually comes in and says we are going to be here to check put a check on all the insanity that's happening in government. All of the three things, three branches of government are supposed to work, but they're all broken because money entered into the equation, right? And because now that you have money, then you can lobby for whatever laws you want. You can bribe whoever you want and you can print as much of the stuff as you want to steer the, the machine in your direction. Well, let, let's just fix that problem with Bitcoin. And I think Bitcoin plus the three pillars of, of a three branch democracy is such a strong system. Like we will just dominate the world with, with an amazing, uh, society if, if we were able to adopt the coin instead of fight it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. I, I have Alex Gladstein coming on in a couple of weeks nice. and I, th I think uh, I'm going to bring up that topic um, about that. Yeah. He's, he's one of my favorite people in the space. Um, love the work he's doing and had a very interesting listen to the recent debate with him and safe talking mm -hmm. about whether democracy is a good thing or not, which is, really uh, made me think a lot. Um, very interesting points brought up by SAFE. I think it's worth listening to because, um, you know, I, I'm probably much more in the Alex Glass scene, like democracy is good, liberal democracy is good camp until I listened to that podcast, podcast which made me like really question my values, which is crazy. Um, but <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, again, I think it's, 
I think bo- both of those guys made a really good point in that podcast, which is they talked about liberal values and you know free speech and all of that being really just the more important thing, whether it's democracy or not. And I really think that Bitcoin is core to that idea. Like it's it's super important to have money that is not coercible in order to have the other rights. It, it almost underlies everything for me. Yeah, and you know if we do see a complete fall and erosion of our society and it just devolves into chaos the beautiful thing about bitcoin is you can take your wealth and move to anywhere Mm -hmm. and it's a great insurance policy yeah Mm -hmm. have a little bit of bitcoin have your stash of freedom cash you know yep rainy day (laughs) (laughs) magical internet money yeah yeah, Yeah. magical internet i mean it's it's that's the thing it's like it's so funny because bitcoin is you know depending on how you come at it like if you're on twitter it's so meme oriented and it's it, sometimes it's a joke and sometimes it's like life and death for other people in other countries. It's, it's all of these things at once. And that's what makes it so powerful because it is this multifaceted thing and it, it works in different ways for different people and it solves different problems. It, it may solve the problem of society or if society collapses, then you're fine still by yourself, right? It, it does all of these things. So it's great. Um, there's almost no reason you should, you should be, you know, at a zero allocation to Bitcoin at this point. It's, it, it would be uh, foolish, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely agree. And uh, that's what I'm trying to tell people, but um, <laughs> they'll get it eventually. It took me a while to get into yeah. it as well. I did a similar journey, heard about it on NPR and, and then I don't even yes. know how I got into it, but I did eventually. But uh, I think you need to be beaten with it a few times and then you need to like forget about it. And then really the price is what does it right. I've yeah. seen this happen with my friends. It's like, I, I've tried to explain Bitcoin for years Everybody thought, ha ha, magic internet money, this is nerd shit. And then like the price goes up and they're like, okay, now I'm convinced I should buy some Bitcoin. Where should I buy it? Um, And that's, you know, I think this is the cycle for a lot of people who aren't in the day to day, who don't see what we see, who don't read what we read. They just kind of like hear about it in the news. Like it's going, you know, it's a 13K today or now it's a little under 13. Um, But people will hear about it in the news and then they're going to wonder why it's a 13K. By the way, I stopped talking about 13K. I talk about... I talk about the market cap now exclusively. I say Bitcoin's worth $280 billion or whatever it is, $250 billion. It's what it is, right? It's $250 billion system. It's pretty big. Uh, you may want to get on board it before it's a trillion dollar system. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've been shifting more to the market cap as well. I, I mean, I think that makes more sense because um, it's good to like compare it to like things like Apple stock in the Mm -hmm. sense of like the, how quickly that grew and uh, how much money people made off of it. But yeah. um, So getting back to Swan Bitcoin, I just want to say, I think you guys are probably the coolest uh, Bitcoin company out there. Um, Thank you. Brady's been cranking out some, like some of the best memes I've ever seen. (laughs) I don't don't know. I wish I had that type of creativity. I dropped my headphone. Yeah, no worries. Um, back, back online. Yeah. But you, yeah, you and Corey together have built something pretty special over there. So, um, what's kind of your vision for the future? Do you have, are you just planning on growing or, uh, offering any other products or yeah. Where, where yeah. are you uh, taking it? Swan, you know, just like Bitcoin, it's a multifaceted company. Um, I think one of the biggest missions that we've had is onboarding new Bitcoiners. And I think we're succeeding there. Um, a lot of the people that we service, maybe more than half, it's hard to say because we don't, we don't do polls or anything, but kind of anecdotally, um, a lot of people are new to Bitcoin. They're, they're coming to us for the first time. Uh, we are their first on-ramp. And that's, that was our mission is really to bring in the next 10 million Bitcoiners um, to educate them. Uh, we say Bitcoiners, not, you know, Bitcoin buyers or crypto traders, because our mission is to actually explain Bitcoin enough to people that they stick around, right? That they're here not to make a quick buck, to sell it when it goes up 10%, uh, like, you know, like some people do, um, they try to trade it and then get totally wrecked. Um, this, this happens with a lot of people who are first introduced to quote unquote Bitcoin or, or cryptocurrency. Um, because they are sent to places like Coinbase and they're just hit with like, you know, 20 other coins. And all of a sudden they're deciding which of these coins to buy, whether they should sell. It's a totally different mindset. With us, the mission was always, first and foremost, education and onboarding. And uh, that's succeeding very well. Uh, We are expanding a lot of the services we offer. So like uh, daily buys are are rolling out right now. Um, We're rolling out wires. 
so people can wire in bigger support, rolling out support for corporate entities, um, which will include, you know, LLC. So if you have like a checkbook IRA, you can, you'll be able to sign up with us. Um, we'll be rolling out IRAs at some point as well. Um, but then, so that's kind of like the serious side, right? Then there's also the fun side. And I think there's a big fun component to, to um, Bitcoin, especially in Bitcoin Twitter. It's more around like stacking sats and, you know, kind of like gamifying the idea of building your stack. Um, and so some of the things we'll be rolling out there include like, you know, formulas, like being able to say, you know, stack the dip every time, you know, it dips a certain amount or maybe like stack when somebody tweets something, um, being more kind of like community oriented around it, having people um, stack certain uh, goals. Like if Bitcoin, you know, if we want to defend 13K, anytime Bitcoin drops below 13K, we're going to stack, right? We're going to har stack harder when it approaches the 13K. So being able to get the community rallied around certain um, milestones like that would be really fun. So we're kind of thinking about that side of things as well um, to keep it fresh for people who are, you know, in a day to day. Uh, but we do have to be realistic. It is, it is serving two different markets. It's tough to explain that stuff to somebody who's coming new to Bitcoin. So we want to make sure that those people are being first and foremost educated on self custody, how to set up a wallet, how to make their account secure. Um, so we're rolling out a lot of guides and stuff like that to make, make that process easier. Um, so it's it's both right it's expanding it's expanding services more on the financial side but also making it more fun uh we see ourselves as a fun company and there's definitely you can see the memes that we're putting out um are, are pretty wild and it's actually brecky's doing a lot of that so shout out to brecky oh, for his yeah. awesome meme work um we also have we've launched this thing called the bitcoin arsenal i don't know if you've seen that mm -hmm. uh so there's a twitter account called the bitcoin arsenal where we basically aggregate memes from the community. So we will put out requests saying like, we want a meme on this topic. Uh, people will submit memes. We run contests and we, we pay them in sats for, for doing memes. And then we just make those available to the community and saying like, this is, here's all the best memes on Bitcoin. Um, and we have a section on our, on our website for that. Uh, it's on Bitcoin.com. And um, you'll see more and more of that over time um, because we do believe that uh, I believe this personally, like we live in a memocracy, right? Like, uh, if you're not sold on that, I mean, I have to, I have to admit that in 2016, I was a little bit blindsided by the Trump win, but yeah. in, in like retrospect, a hundred percent, like easy, to, easy to see, right? Like it was all about the memes and his memes were just so much better. Um, and like, this is, this is where we live now. So um, I think Bitcoin has incredibly good memes, uh, very strong uh, stuff. And you'll see people like Michael Saylor, who uh, CEO of MicroStrategy just came into Bitcoin, you know, this, last couple of months, just out of nowhere, bought $450 million worth of Bitcoin. And it's generating like the most amazing means on Twitter right now. Um, people just come out of nowhere and they get it. They get the culture uh, and they produce such strong content. And that strong content is going to carry us into the next wave of adoption. Um, it really is that simple. It's putting out good content will, will bring the users. So that's, that's what we're about at Swan. Um, you know, meme aggregation and amplification is, is super important. Are you guys going to suggest for people to buy during quad four? <laughs> for sure. You know, I'll always buy, we'll, we'll have a special quad four bucket. Sign up here. Anytime Keith tw tweets quad four, we're buying. Uh, I mean, this is the kind of stuff like you attack people that, you know, by the way, respect to Keith McCullough. He's a cool guy. Uh, Hedge has got some good content, but I mean, they're traders, right? So people make fun of traders in Bitcoin because traders get wrecked uh, very classically. It all works until it doesn't. Um, because Bitcoin doesn't care about quad four. It doesn't care about anything, right? It's a whole different system. And, and the funny thing about Bitcoin is that we're so early that any small shift in adoption, right? Like today we had PayPal announced that they're rolling out Bitcoin. Uh, a week or two ago, we had the news from uh, Square that it bought $15 million of Bitcoin. This little bit of news comes out of nowhere. And all of a sudden it's a monster shift in the mindset of people who are before like, uh, Bitcoin is for criminals and Ponzi's and now it's, oh shit, public companies are buying Bitcoin. What happened? Like when did that switch happen? I don't even, ha I don't know. It just happened. Right. And so that tiny little bit of demand generated by, uh, by new people just like waking up and realizing that something has shifted. Uh, it just, it, it eviscerates everything. It just, the price goes to the moon because the supply is so constrained. So it's not going to work. All these models are, are ridiculous. Uh, these quad fours or whatever <laughs> are, uh, I think they they might work for traditional assets, but not at, at the point of Bitcoin where like we're, you know, it's such a small percentage of adoption in the world that a tiny move will just double the price. Um, yeah. that will, will get all of your algos wrecked. So good luck. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, it was a funny interview. <laughs> um, I really enjoyed it. Um, it was good, though. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, I think I think the day that we will know that Bitcoin really won is the day that Peter Schiff uh, capitulates. <laughs> but uh, I, I may never come. He he has to save face, and like the thing is, his, he's got his son. His son is already stacking Bitcoin, so it's all good. You know, he's covered on both sides. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think for him at this point, it's just like a brilliant marketing strategy because there's so many people that would have never heard of him had he uh i mean he's a really smart guy but had mm -hmm. he never i would have never heard of him had he never been trashing bitcoin um <laughs> yeah oh, for actually, sure I, I think that's what people have discovered i think that's the same reason keith, keith mccullough's heated up on, on bitcoin as well is you know he likes stirring up the hornet's nest he likes the engagement um and that's why he should i mean that's that's the funny thing is like uh people you know have said like it, if you are in 2020, not talking about Bitcoin, you're going to become irrelevant. If you're a financial advisor and you don't have a position on Bitcoin, you're going to become irrelevant. You have to have a position on Bitcoin. You have to be educated on it because your customers are going to demand it. So it's going to permeate every single macro podcast, every single financial advisor. It's going to be everywhere, every single media site, right? You can't not talk about it. So uh, it's just kind of like Trump. It's, it's a very good example, right? Of something that just permeated and you couldn't not talk about it because he made so much noise you had to have an opinion and it's the same thing with bitcoin there's so much noise and the and the bitcoiners are so vocal about it right and they're so uh meme -y about it that you just have to have an opinion and it's it, that's how it gets there right it's how how we have the culture shift which i think is what actually creates the adoption events yeah yeah absolutely um where can people uh follow your work um, so you can find me uh, at, uh, on Twitter at SKWP, uh, pronounced scoop, SKWP. And then uh, Swan Bitcoin is at swanbitcoin.com. Um, you can get my book, uh, which is Inventing Bitcoin. You can actually get it for free right now uh, if you go to event.swanbitcoin.com slash free book, um, which is where we're giving it away. Uh, please, even if you've read it, go and take one and pass it on to a friend because really that's what it's there for. It's, you know, it's not for Bitcoiners. It's for, it's for that special no coiner in your life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but yeah, swanbitcoin.com. We have a weekly show called the Swan Signal. Um, I'm also part of a syndicate. It's an angel list uh, investment syndicate, but along with Corey and Stefan Lavera and Louis Liu, uh, it's called Bitcoiner Ventures. So if you're somebody with some amount of uh, net worth and you want to invest in Bitcoin companies uh, alongside with us, we don't take any kind of fees. Uh, angel list does take a fee, but we don't. Um, and you know, we, we, we've invested in upstream data and we'll probably be doing some more of that. So, um, if you're no obligation, if you want to sign up and hear about the deals that are going on, you can do that. Awesome. Yeah. And I definitely suggest the book, especially you, you can get it for free in print, but, uh, guys, Swan's voice is pretty great. Um, listening to it on audible too. Um, so yeah, highly. it's a great, I mean, Guy Swan did a fantastic job with that book. Um, it, it reads really well, uh, with his voice. So. Yeah, much better than what I would have done. So shout yeah. out to you guys, Juan. Thank you. Yeah, if I ever write a book, I'll have them narrate it too. <laughs> well, appreciate you coming on. My pleasure, man. It was a great chat. That was a really fun podcast, an interview with Jan. And Swan Bitcoin is a really cool company. They launched in March and they're education oriented. So they're one of the best places to go if you're new to the space. They're not going to sell you a bunch of altcoin nonsense like some of the other people um, that are out there. So I think it's just a good place to start to get the best money known to man and to get real quality education, whether it's through the Swan Signal podcast, um, getting Jan's book for free or, uh, you know, all the other avenues that, and resources that they do to help educate the Bitcoin community. If you like the podcast and you want to support what I'm doing and get the word out there in our community about Bitcoin, one of the best ways to do that is by liking and subscribing, um, leaving a review, doing all that stuff. Uh, another way that you can support me is on Patreon, and there's you know different options for different amounts of money, and uh, you can support me for as little as a dollar a month. Um, I also do run a BTC pay server, so you can send me Bitcoin if you want. And that goes a long way to, you know, helping me pay for expenses or buy 
nano ledgers to give out to people or you know buying the bitcoin standard to give to people and yeah um thanks for stopping by and listening